What's up, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Hot Mic here on the Outlaw Nation channel. I am the Outlaw, John Rook, joined as always by the man with all the insider information. That's why he calls himself the Insider. How are you, Jeff Snyder? I'm good, Johnny Boy! <laughs> Back You're in Boston, Coast, already freezing my ass off. Already? Oh, yeah, in Boston, right? You're on the East Coast right now. Uh, that's why we had to move our time up to 12 o'clock PT, so thanks to everybody who's joining us right off the bat. We're going to have some fun talking about stuff that's going on in the world of entertainment for sure. But uh, how are you feeling there in Boston? What's the weather? What, was it 30, 40? What's the degrees over there on the East Coast? It's not fun, whatever it is. Uh, I, I, it would sure would be great to just be with my family in warm weather sometime. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm back for my, my niece's birthday party. I don't get invited to parties anymore. So hey. I'm party invite. I'm, I will fly across the country to go. Family's important. Everybody knows that family is important for sure. Uh, all right, we're going to get into so much going on in the world of entertainment. Of course, the Writers Guild strike finally over now. Of course, pending the ratification vote in October, uh, the uh, SAG after is going to start negotiating on Monday. But uh, people can go oh! back to work on the WGA side of things. Very happy, Jeff. All these influencers can stop wringing their hands, wondering if they should cover stuff. Now they're allowed to cover stuff all over the place. We're also going to jump into some of James Gunn's comments about the DC canon that was recently on threads, all the stuff that he said there, the Christopher Nolan, James Bond rumors, the Ava DuVernay uh, case that is going forward with Netflix, uh, the Argyle trailer dropped earlier today, some new Golden Globes categories, and maybe some reviews for the creator in Saw X. And also, Jeff threw in a peculiar subject, a peculiar topic. He called it Guillermo del Toro and Steven Spielberg. Our, our quote whores. So Stephen we'll King. be Stephen King. <laughs> Stephen King. Sorry, Stephen King. Our quote whores. And we'll be uh, taking a look at that later on. But yeah. Jeff, we'd be remiss not to start with the Writers Guild uh, deal being over. And just a reminder the uh, Streamlabs and Super Chats are open. So start sending in your stuff now as we're going to answer these questions as we go along. But yes, the Writers Guild deal, the Writers Guild has set a, a deal here with the AMPTP. The lawyers have looked it over it and the strike is over. And as I said, this is pending the vote, of course, in October, but, but Rikers can go That's back to work yeah. as of Wednesday. So what are your thoughts on the deal here? Do you want me to go through the points here, or do you just want to give your overall thoughts on uh, the reaction to the strike being over? Um, I mean, I think I think there's no question that, this, that the new contract will be ratified by the membership. They had a huge meeting last night, and yeah. You know, one of the trades described it like a, a rock, uh, a rock concert, basically. So yes. it seems like the membership is very much um, in favor of the tentative agreement uh, mm -hmm. that the guild leader struck. Um, I think it is a, a pretty exceptional deal. I mean, that's the word that they use to sort of tout it. And when you look at yeah. it, um, I think it is very, very strong. So, uh, you know, there are certain elements like, you know, they got the AI protections that they were looking for. Yes. Like, you know, AI is not going to be considered source or, you know, literary material. I mean, a writer can use it if they choose to use it, right. you know, if the company, if their employer allows it, but the employer cannot force a writer to use AI. You have to notify a writer uh, when they give them, you know, the material that was, you know, uh, created by AI or partially yeah. created by AI. So I think uh, on the AI front, you know, th they got pretty much everything they were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, it still feels like early days. And again, that may be an inevitability that, that AI is utilized more, but for the next three years, at least they're going to yeah. look at, you know, how it, how it's used, that kind of thing. Yeah. It was about mitigating the effect of AI. And I think that's what they did here in the end uh, result. And let's re hit some of these points real quick. The job GA said the total value of the deal was 233 million, which is, which is up from the 86 million that the AMPTP was offering three year film and TV contract raises, uh, have uh, the raise has gone up here. The basic wage, uh, sorry, let me read this again. The three year film and TV contract raises basic wages by 5% in the first year, followed by 4% in, in year two and 3.5% in year three. The AMPTP settled with WG on 12.5% when the Writers Guild wanted a 16% increase. The other side of this is the writer secured a 76% increase in foreign streaming residuals. For example, 
The GA, the, according to WGA, this will increase their residuals from Netflix from like 18,000 to 32,000 plus for a single hour long episode. They'll also receive viewer based streaming bonuses, which are based on the length of the show or if the streaming feature is a budget over 30 million and about, and it'll be based on views and there'll be confidential viewership shared between the WGA and the AMPTP. Also, they got a lot of uh, concessions. On the staffing, the studios must hire at least three writer-producers, including the showrunner, for a guaranteed 10 consecutive weeks of work during the developmental series. Once the projects are green-lighted, the minimum of writers increases to five, and teams working on shows with 13 or more episodes will receive another writer, and those projects that come with at least 20 weeks of guaranteed work or the post-green-light room duration, whichever is shorter. And as Jeff some mentioned... Some writers, so some writers like Mike White, John, can still yeah. write solo. That's still allowed. Right. Or uh, Taylor Sheridan. They, they'll still be allowed to write solo, but there are requirements. So, Jeff, you were saying earlier, a few weeks ago that you felt the WG was going to have to concede a lot of their points here to get this thing done. But it does sound like they held the line. This last uh, um, salvo was all the daytime talk show stuff, coincidentally. And then, boom, this deal was done in five days in time for Yom Kippur. Are you surprised at how much the WGA got out of this situation with the AMPTP? Or do you think the AMPTP slid one by the WGA so they could look like they won a lot, but they still retain a lot more of their problem? No, I, th I think this is a great deal for the WGA. I said that they'd have to give on some things. and Yeah. They did. Like, they asked for the cent raise, they got a cent raise. Like, you're not going to get everything that you asked for in a negotiation. That's why it's called a negotiation. Right. Um, I, you know, the, the, you know, there were important things that they got, like, I, I think that they, they sort of said that they addressed something for everybody in every sector, yeah. whether you're a new writer, a, a mid-level writer or an experienced uh, sort of pro, right. uh, you know, one of the big things is that uh, writing teams are going yeah. to get health insurance, right? Yes. Uh, that that is a, a big thing because um, that wasn't always given uh, necessarily. I mean, screenwriters are, have now been guaranteed a second step, so it's not yes. like you just write one draft and get bounced off of it. Yes, uh, which, you know, I, I think is also important. Um, you know, the, the data viewership stuff like that that is important uh, mm -hmm. because right with a success based residual. Well, how do yeah. we define success and how do we measure it? But what the AMPTP did was they're also allowed to cover up their losses. Yes. So they don't actually have to share, you know, uh, viewership stats for every program. It's just the programs that are sort of, uh, you know, viewed, you know, with like, I think it's what, 20 by 20% um, yeah. of, of the, of the, you know, streamers subscribers within the first year of release or is, is mm -hmm. that what it is? Yeah. Uh, so you know, and, and I think that that is why the AMPTP was pushing back on that stuff. They don't want to have to reveal their failures. It's embarrassing to, to the talent and creatives. And it's also sure. embarrassing to Wall Street to be like, we just blew tens of millions of dollars on the show. And, you know, two people watched it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so, you know, that that's a good compromise. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to tell you about our, our wins and, and yeah. share the money on those wins. But, yeah, we're not going to tell you about our losses. That, you know, unfortunately, that still makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there have been some writers that have already come out, as I said last week, might happen, and have been so, well, some writers, some critics of the deal who've come out and 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 pinpointed certain things that weren't a uh, hundred percent what they wanted. But in the end, I mean, it seems like, as you said, if you look on social media and see those uh, see those uh, meetings from last night or two nights ago, the the raucous reaction of so many of the members uh, to this deal is pretty incredible. And I think it's kind of smart, uh, to wait a week before they negotiate with the, with SAG after, uh, so that you kind of let the things die down, let them have their moment. And then SAG will come in and slide right. in and do what they're doing. And this is what I said on the last podcast, John, mm -hmm. which was on Wednesday, you know, source yeah. they need to five days of negotiations. Now I hadn't counted Sunday because I thought they were going to take off Sunday for the weekend and Monday for right. Yom Kippur. So I said Tuesday would be the last day. But in the end, it was, in fact, five days. They committed yeah. to five days and they got it done in five days. The, the sad part of this all is if all it took was five days, you know, why do we have to? Why did this last five months? And, and that's just, yeah. you know, that was the AMPTP's plan. Like, you know, they certainly wanted to. They weren't going to come back to the table un, un, until they really had to. Yeah. Um. Yeah, a lot of people were hurt in the in the interim. Like people lost their homes, people have lost yeah. their jobs, people have left Los Angeles, uh, and that's that sucks. Um, 
I do wish that the AMPTP had come to the table a little bit sooner. Yeah. But I do think that everyone is ready for to go back to work and for all of this to be over. And I do think that SAG will have a deal by mid-October. Yeah, it does feel like, yeah, I, I'll agree with that. It does feel like this was something that could have been done earlier. And if you read, there's a great vanity, a variety article uh, breaking down what happened here behind the scenes and how long this took to get done. And I don't mean the 146 days. I mean, when they finally got serious about it, that it was a bunch of back and forths, a bunch of uh, calls behind the scenes, conversations here from Chris Kaiser and David Goodman on, on the uh, WGA side of things with uh, uh, Sony uh, Entertainment uh, Chairman there, CEO Tony Vincicara as well, Ted Sarandos. Zaslov was certainly much more involved. He was described in this piece as the coach trying to get everybody across the finish line. But Jeff, one thing that came out in this article and some of the other uh, stuff that came out before the deal was signed or the deal was agreed to was that the WGA came at the last minute with these requests when they thought that the deal had made, when the, the AMPTP side had thought the deal was already squared away. What do you think about it? Do you think that was hubris? Do you think that was a negotiating tactic? Do you think that this was a little self-destructive? Well, what did you think of this coming in right near the last moment with these new demands and these new requirements that almost derailed the deal? What did you think of that? Uh, I think that that was accurate. And I think that is the WGA. You know, like there was a report that, uh, what was it, Kaiser or Goodman, one of them had, had basically said, go back and like squeeze them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, but you know, I, I think Bob Iger had the right inclination as has been reported where like when the WGA said, listen, you know, we're, we're, we're cool with everything, but we also, we've gotten support on our picket lines from SAG yeah. and other guilds and unions and stuff. And we want our members to be able to stand by SAG. Yeah. It's all said and done without any fear of re repercussions or consequences. And yeah, I think at that point, Bob Iger was right to be like, listen, guys, we've given you everything. There's no way we're going to like let you do that. So like either take this deal or like we'll yeah. we'll, we'll wait till January if you want. You right. Know? right. So right. Uh, I'm glad that the WGA recognized that. Listen, writers are still allowed to go out on, on the picket. Yes. Line. Yes. yes. But yeah, yes. if they have to be at work, <laughs> you can't use that as a reason to not show up. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and yes, uh, rooms are, you know, it, 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 you can tell on social media, like people were ready for the, for the dam yes. to lift because, you know, everyone started sending out scripts and, you know, can you read this? Can you read that? It's uh, people are going to need some time to get their careers back up and running. Yeah. You know, it's going to take a little time to see, well, what, what are we actually moving forward with? You know, what didn't survive the strike uh, and right. what rooms can we start, you know, get to get going right now? Well, and two, th two things uh, to connect it to this. One, uh, leading back to what you had said a few weeks ago on the show, which is this idea of how are they going to be able to mend fences and build bridges again with some of the rhetoric that was involved here. But if you read this piece, it seems like the people who were in charge were negotiating in good faith a majority of the time in this whole situation. It was the people on the picket lines who were like raging and yelling and, and making fun and all this kind of stuff. So do you think there will be repercussions down the road for some of these writers that were more vocal in their protest uh, of, the, uh, of the AMPTP and coming after these studio heads with some of the vitriol that they came after them? Although it was fair and it was warranted, I think, in a number of occasions, do you think that they will kind of shadow be, be shadow banned down the road because that's really something difficult to prove you know no i don't really think so i okay. think that the, the ceos have to know like you know tensions were high there's a lot on the line mm. they're you know they were cast as the villains in, in this and, and they're going to get criticism on, online i don't think that donna langley or bob Iger are, are cruising twitter you know looking <laughs> for the personal insults that were that were shouted against them or whatever yeah. um you know i think it was kind of gross that I think it was Matt Matt Bellany on uh you know in his newsletter who was sort of and, and it was a, it was fair to question I think I think his it's a fair question. newsletter yeah 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 it's it's fair to question you know will there be re repercussions which may yeah. have just been what what Bellany did but you know then he named some people yeah. uh, you know and it, it just felt like unfair targeting like yeah these are the leaders online uh you know where the battle was won right on yeah, on yeah, social yeah. media social kind media. of these guys were the were the really vocal leaders and now what they should have a target or a bullseye on their back because of it. You know, when all this, all this is said and done, I don't think that studio heads or business affairs is going to really hold those people responsible. I think that in the end, they, those people are right to not really worry writers hire other writers. Yeah. 
yeah. showrunners hire writers. They saw how those guys were doing. But it, it's also like, I don't know. I'm not trying to hire a strike captain just because they're a strike captain or just because right. they, they put out some great tweets uh, during the show. Like, can you write a script? Yeah. That, that's can you make me money? Yeah. It's the only thing that, that, that should matter. Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot about chemistry in, in the room and, you know, getting along with it. You have to be mm -hmm. a team. You can't be, you know, um, selfish or anything. Uh, yeah. but I, I, I don't think there will be any repercussions now. Now, what about this? these late reports that the showrunners were putting pressure on the WGA negotiating committee and the heads of them, to the, the big showrunners, to get this done? They're denying it, but do you think that there was pressure put on? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, I definitely think so. I don't think that those reports were pulled out of thin air. I mean, hmm. again, the WGA and, and these vocal people who we were just referencing yeah. can say whatever they want. Yeah but there's no way you have that many people and they're all on the same page and they all have the exact same idea of how to go about this. And they all just trust the negotiating committee. No, like yeah, there, there are people who are like Greg Berlanti is employs like a thousand people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, and these people are looking to him for answers. Uh, so I definitely think that the W that, that the big showrunners did lean on the WJ not to like, Hey guys, go make a deal, make a deal. But it's like, okay, what is going on? Right. Right. You know, keep us informed and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing I, I have to say that I, I yeah. don't care for is just a lot of these really vocal writers, like shitting all over the entertainment journalists. Uh, you oh know. yeah. I didn't see that. What, 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 can you just, get an example? Yeah. You know, just like, and I saw Adam Conover went on, went on Bellany's podcast and on the Anglers mm -hmm. podcast to sort of talk about these things. Um, but like, you know, a lot of people took shots at Bellany ever, you know, the, the trades, whatever it was. And I get there's a lot of misinformation out there and, and that the AMPTP yeah. is, you know, appealing directly to the trades. And, and, you know, that's what the trades are there for. They're there yeah. to carry the water for, for the AMPTP, not for the writers, but it's like the writers, they just like left it up to social media, you know, yeah. like, it's not like, the, the writers just kept saying, like, believe, you know, only listen to the WGA. No, don't only listen to the WGA. Listen to the reporters who you trust the rest of the year, too. I mean, we're right. we're trying to present both sides of it, which is where some of the you're a union troll or shill or whatever, you know, a lot of that stuff comes from. I don't think I really got accused of, of any of that stuff. Yeah, I didn't see that. I actually was, was you know, but I'm not the one, like, doing leading coverage. Right. Of, of the industry. So I think that there was a lot of criticism. Some of it was fair, but some of it was just like a pile on where it's like, you guys don't even know how this works. And if you, this isn't, if you don't want the trades to carry the AMPT's message, then fucking call a reporter and start spilling to them. You know, yeah. don't leave yeah. the WJ an official to, to, to issue an official comment. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that uh, the two writers who covered it for the THR tweeted out like, thank you to everybody who was kind to us on the strike line and not everybody was, but thank you for those who were and for allowing us to be, to interview you all and get your points of views out there. So clearly the tensions were very high because people's livelihoods were on the line, Jeff, I imagine. And the, the anger and the frustration, but also, you know, just like it happens nowadays on social media, people pile on people unleash their rage and whatever. And so you see that going on. So that is an element that's undeniable, but well, hopefully there's a lot of people it. who are like, Oh, like, you know, do your job, get the story straight. It's like, yeah. okay, but when I call you, what's going to happen? You're just going to say no comment and plan. Right. Out. Right. So like, if no one's going to help us get the story, then, you know, you'd take whatever story someone helps you get. And the AMP yeah. team was, you know, was certainly out there whispering in everybody's ear. Um, yeah. I think THR did a good job with its coverage. I thought Katie Kilkenny did a really good job. Um, yeah, she did. Yeah. All these entertainment reporters worked their asses off. They were out there on the lines interviewing yeah. people in the heat. Uh, and I know that is that is the job and everything. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I just don't like how the entertainment journalists kind of got shit on during the strike. <laughs> this is the game, man. You know this. I mean, no one's going to... Oh, there's, 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 no, there's nothing... Yeah, there's nothing. Everybody's a target at some point in this business, Jeff. You know that. For all the kumbaya, progressive, let's hug each other, let's make movies about accepting everybody's differences, people are always going to go after each other in the entertainment world. Always going to be targets, whether it's the studios or the writers or the actors or the director. I mean, DGA, how much shit did the DGA take for doing their deal so early all these months? And look, a lot of the construct of the DGA deal was used for the WGA deal. So the fact that that was already squared away months ago, you can almost say like, 
hey, yes, the A and P TV dragged their feet, but working that deal out with the DGA allowed them to have at least a foundational construct from which to deal with the WGA. So in a way, it kind of helped, even though it may have been a bit of uh, drama there between the directors and the writers and actors. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, any, any, any concerns about the deal overall, Jeff, before we wrap up this conversation about it, any loopholes that you see, any issues that you see in all of this, especially the AI stuff, are there any ways around this? Do you think the studios just gave them this for three years and then are just absolutely as AI becomes massive are absolutely going to kind of change the uh, terms of the deals, the deal as it goes forward or challenge it in court? What are your thoughts here? I, I, I honestly don't know. And I'm not a writer so i can't look at that document and see the loopholes okay so that there are a few yes um you know things to, to keep an eye on or whatever and, and that's really like what it's about it's about the enforcement yeah right can you yeah you have a, an mba but can it be enforced right um, and, right. and that's right. gonna take that that's a team effort that's agents too that's agents being like you know the they used to just be like, all right, this is what they're offering. Like, take the deal. Yeah. Right. And now it's like, well, you know, you're, you're going to have to go back and, and um, negotiate some more because according yeah. to the, you know, I just, I don't know. I'm kind of like striked out. I'm just like fucking okay. ready for the shit to be done. I'm ready for, yeah. I think SAG will be done in the next two or three weeks. Like my buddy sort okay. of said, um, yeah. and we'll get back to work. That sounds good. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's hit some of these Streamlabs uh, and Super Chats that have come through, uh, Jeff. Mike Joyce says, when with the studios meeting with SAG on Monday, I got a good feeling they'll come to an agreement by the end of next week. Am I being too optimistic next week? Seems a little fast. Yeah. Um, but again, the, the WGA thing, which I think is more complicated. Yeah. A little mm -hmm. bit. In a way. Than SAG. I don't know. I don't know. SAG my, you know, SAG is prickly. Yeah, you're right. No, SAG is prickly. It's gonna take, I think, a couple weeks. It's big. There's obviously a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay, you're right. Uh, I don't. I don't think it'll be a week. Um, yeah. I, I think mid October. Because SAG doesn't have to go back to work. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's WG. You gotta write the scripts. Right. right. You gotta write the scripts first for the SAG actor. Now promoting their stuff. That's a separate conversation for sure. I can understand, especially with Marvels coming in November. But I don't think they're gonna be in any rush. Because I'll tell you this about actors being an actor being in SAG. Great. The Writers Guild has a spotlight right now. Let them have the spotlight. Then we want our own spotlight. And I guarantee you that's another part of this. They're going to wait till the dust dies down on the WGA stuff. And then SAG's going to announce their deal. And that's how it's going to go. So that's that right. makes sense. Uh, Wiley OFC says, watch Gran Turismo last night. Amazing film that blew me away. Also got to see Blue Beetle. Love it. Amazing soundtrack. Yeah. Two good films, right, Jeff? Yeah. I like both of them. Yeah. Good soundtracks as well. Thank you, Wiley. Good to see you, brother. Joel Davis says, any idea how the, how the writer's rooms, sorry, any idea on how the writer's room rules in the deal will affect future seasons of Star Wars and Marvel shows? Example, will Filoni still be writing episodes of Ahsoka season two? I think you kind of said something about that when it came to uh, Mike White uh, or Taylor Sheridan. So do you think Filoni will still, if he wants to do it, be able to? Yes. If he wants to write all episodes of Ahsoka season two, he will. It doesn't mean that he won't still have like a writer's room to like, have conversations or kick around ideas, but it'll still be Filoni who's credited for writing all the episodes. Yeah. Uh, Francisco Lopez says, Hey guys, do you think there will be a strike between the SAG and the video game industry or will they get it done before it goes to strike? Yeah, Jeff, we just voted to strike uh, the uh, video game side of things on the SAG side of things as well. So a new strike is uh, starting here on this side, just as Spider-Man 2 is about to come out with my brother, Yuri Lowenthal. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this is going to be all kind of, swallowed up in the whole sag after deal as well uh i really haven't been paying attention to the video okay. game industry strike uh I, I i don't know why we need to just go on strike 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 like fucking yeah. negotiate a contract uh no i don't anticipate a strike against the video game industry i, I think like you a lot of fans are striked out uh, i mean obviously you're more than a fan jeff but like people are striked out and so they want to just negotiate this thing and move forward and have things back in their lives the world is crazy enough People need entertainment. Um, let's see. Golden Donuts says, love the podcast. Do you think if SAG settles soon, movies that got delayed due to inability to promote, like Challengers, Dune 2 might move back up, might reclaim their release dates? Jeff, your thoughts? It's a possibility. I don't see it happening. Um, I mean, Challengers, Challengers definitely not. Challengers is, is moved. Um, it missed 
its fall festival window. I mean, unless it could do like some late AFI birth. Um, but yeah. it just seems like the award season is kind of like settled in already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dune 2 is an interesting one. I don't anticipate that it will move back into its date or that they'll like, you know, move it into Aquaman's date or Wonka's date. I don't think that that will ultimately happen. Um, but it could. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all about, you know, what the books look like and, and making sure we have one big tentpole per quarter and, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if those actors are available. Maybe those actors are going off to, to shoot stuff. Good um, yeah. you know, or maybe they're, they've are they blocked off time next March to promote Dune 2 already, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't see it happening now. Yeah, I, I'd be surprised if any of them reclaimed any big ones. Because you know how the system works. They want to have months of promotion, months of a rollout, and uh, set you know uh, uh, covers with magazines, uh, interviews. That All that gets affected by all of this, especially with a big film. So I think they'll keep Doom to where it is in Challengers as well. We'll see if any of the smaller ones move back. But I like Jeff, I'd be surprised myself. I just think, too, with, with Barbie, it's like, what does Warner Brothers even need Dune this year for? A right, for? right. Right, right. Why muddy the waters with Barbie? Like, focus on Barbie, see what you can win with Barbie. And I then think. you'll have two years in a row with two massive blockbusters that could get you some awards. Yeah, good point. Tyler Treese says, keep up the great work, Kings. What's your favorite Paul Dano performance? Jeff, do you have a favorite Paul Dano performance? Ooh. That's a good question. So many good ones. <laughs> he's, re- he's so good. Um, oh, Paul Dano fan, I see. Yeah, all right. I mean, I really, I really love his work in Prisoners. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I, I like that. I mean, there will be blood. That is one that I really enjoy from him as well. I think the Batman is great up until he does the whole boom shit in the in the uh, prison cell. Um, but yeah, I think Prisoners is probably the answer. I mean, the movie that I moved to L.A. The the reason you know the movie that brought me mm. out to L.A. was The Girl Next Door. Oh um, yeah, right. Plays, plits. Right. Uh, and I, I think he's really good in that one, too. Yeah. Uh, he was in The Sopranos for a couple episodes, for people who don't know. Um, I he remember... a friend of uh, AJ? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Ruby Sparks. I remember that film because I have a massive crush on Zoe Kazan. And I went, I saw that, and then Paul was in it. And I was like, wow, this is such a different color on him. Although the film wasn't 100% great. I kind of liked uh, seeing him in a role like that, so I enjoyed him in something like that. And I've never seen Swiss Army Man, but a lot of people say that's a good one as well for his uh, work. So, um, all right, let's see oh, the stream. Swiss Army Man, I think, got him the role in Dumb Money. Oh, really? Yeah. If okay. you actually uh, read my interview with director Craig Gillespie on Above the Line, and uh-huh. I'll have an interview with the writer soon, although I'm not sure which website it's going to be on. Um, mm. Uh, yeah, I think it was Swiss Army Man was the, was the role that convinced him like he he has what it takes to play Roaring Kitty. Hmm. Well, that's a good point. And I liked him in that movie. Uh, uh, you know, it's out now. It's, he's, it's another damn good performance from Paul Dano in that movie. Um, let's hit the stream labs real quick. Nancy Mallory says, would you visit Shrek Swamp that's hosted by Airbnb in Scotland? Yeah, this is happening, Jeff. They are renting out uh, Airbnbs in Shrek Swamp in Scotland. Would you go try, try it out there, Jeff? Sure. I mean, am I getting paid? <laughs> Are they flying me out there and putting me up in the Airbnb? I'll, I'll give it five stars. Wow, you'll buy. Oh, Jesus. They, they, uh, they all right. I review for a free trip to Scotland to, to stay in a swamp with an ogre. <laughs> Welcome, Jim. Cameron Welcome Diaz. There. Say, say that again. Cameron Diaz, be there to greet me. Okay. All right. See, we, we were doing so good. All right. Love says. I personally think it's time for Lucasfilm to recast the big three, Han, Leia, and Luke, and skip the whole deep fake technology. I think the audience will accept and embrace it. What do you think? Do you think they will do it? Um, I think they will absolutely do it. I think we're moving towards it. I think the little girl that was in Kenobi was kind of like the first shot across the bow at uh, teasing a uh, recasting. And I also think we all need to get over it and recast. There's a whole new generation that didn't grow up with Luke and Leia and Han, and they're more about the sequel trilogy or the TV shows or the prequel trilogy. So recasting, I think, is only going to anger the old nerds who've got YouTube channels and whatever. But in the end, you've got to move forward. And I think Leia is mentioned in the most recent episode of Ahsoka, 
And to me, that's yet another move towards the possibility of her coming in as a recast. And I don't think it'll be Billy Lord. I think it might be Millie Bobby Brown or somebody else coming in to play her. Same thing with Luke. A lot of people reacted negatively to the uh, deep fake of Luke in The Mandalorian. And so I think in the end, that's where they're going to go when it's all said and done. And we should just get over it. Jeff, what are your thoughts? And they basically recast Solo already, right? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked to see younger actors you know, play those iconic characters. Um, although I don't think that that should be the focus of these new, the, this next batch of new movies. I think that That's they need new, new stories, new characters, new worlds. Yeah. Have them like pop in, but not necessarily be the central focus. Yeah, that I makes sense. I don't even think you need these pop-ins. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fair. You, just not even, you mention them, but not even see them. All right. That's fair. Uh, Hot Security Guard says, Jeff, it finally happened. Took the train from central New Jersey and two subways to the Angelic in New York City's to see Flora and Son. Loved it. Soundtrack has been on repeat. Roka, I think you'd love it. Hey, I have it already queued up on my Apple TV screeners, but it drops tomorrow anyway. Seeing the creator and Saw X this weekend. Thank you both for everything. There you go, Jeff. Hey, shout out to you. Uh, should we talk about the creator? You want to do it now? Okay, hey, let's take a quick break because we're at the 30-minute mark, and then we can talk about the creator, do our mini review here uh, right after this. All right, Jeff, the creator out in theaters this weekend from Gareth Edwards, uh, starring John David Washington, uh, and Allison Janney, uh, and a number of actors, including the young actress there, Madeline. Your thoughts uh, on the creator? I really wanted to love this movie. Mm. I really wanted to. I can't. It, it, you know, I, it, I I keep coming back to what Eric Weber tweeted about it, which is just mm-hmm. like it's an it's an empty spectacle. Like it, 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 it seems to have all these ideas and stuff behind it, but it just felt very like kind of convoluted. I, I thought the second, the second half, just like, or maybe it's just the third act. It, be, it, it, it totally lost me. Um, so while it looks gorgeous and it may very well be the future of what movies look like, mm. I mean, that looks like a, a, a movie that costs two or three times what it costs, which was 80, 85 million. Yeah. The, the cinematography is, is stunning. Um, and, and it, it may change, like, again, change the way that movies are made and shot. Yeah. But from a story perspective, I thought this was kind of a bust. Uh, I think all of his movies have issues. All he, I don't think he's a bad filmmaker. I think he's actually mm-hmm. really talented, Gareth. But, like, all of his movies are two and a half star movies. They're not good. They're not bad. They're right in the middle. Uh, and I think that this one was miscast. John David Washington... I don't know he if he doesn't work for you. He doesn't work for you, does he? he? Does. I don't think he does. Yeah. I, I, I still think the best thing I saw him in was as the cocky wide receiver on Ballers. Yeah. He's good at, well, it's a free role. Like, it's a freeing role. Like, you can play all kinds of things. They let him play in a big old sandbox in Ballers, and they're trying to turn him into a movie star now over the last few years with Tenet and with here with uh, with the creator. I'm going to have to go and agree mostly with Jeff. I think Gareth Edwards directed a phenomenally beautiful film. I think he always delivers when it comes to the visuals on the screen. And there's a lot here that you actually will catch yourself going, how the hell was this only $85 million with the special effects? I mean, there are some Blade Runner-esque scenes in this that are gorgeous, that are incredible that he was able to capture that I don't see in 200, 300, $400 million films that uh, capture that kind of realty or realness in the shot. So, Overall, I think that's one of the reasons to go see it on the biggest screen possible. But I agree with Jeff on the story. This is where I think it lost me because I wanted to like it. I wanted to love it. I was looking forward to it. But they don't do enough to establish the John David Washington, Gemma Chan relationship. You have to be so invested in that relationship to buy everything that happens. And especially in the final third, when we have some moments that are leaps in logic or convenient occurrences Or situations where you're like, wait, somebody would have stopped that kid or something. So there are moments there in the end that you're just like, ah, I literally threw my hands up in the air in one of the moments going like, come on, like, come on, this is logical. Somebody should have figured this out. So that's the problem with the movie overall. I do see other people calling it a masterpiece or saying it should be nominated for best picture. So I'm not going to shit on people who feel that way about it. But for me, I agree with Jeff. The story wasn't strong enough 
to hold you in. And they introduce characters that they give you no backstory for and then put them through the ringer. And you're like, wait, why am I supposed to care about these people? You didn't give me time with them. So I think there's a three to four hour cut that's a lot better. But hmm. this cut that they put out just seems, as Jeff said, a little soulless in the end, which is a shame because I think John David's a damn good actor. And this just in the end, this doesn't do I him any good. I like the young actress. I like the Madeline uh, Voiles or whatever. And um, yeah, and I like seeing Allison Janney play against. Yes. But yeah, J John David was an issue. And, and uh, even like Ken Watanabe, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. Well, I, don't, I don't come on now. Let's leave, leave Ken alone. Ken's a good goddamn actor. He, yeah, he, Matt, he's a great actor, but it's like, well, I don't know, what is this? Right. Like, What's where's his backstory? What do we know about him? Right. Exactly. That's the frustrating part of it all. It's, it's a B B minus movie. Madeline Yuna Voiles is the actress, and she's incredible. Her and John David had nice chemistry in the movie. That helps you, but it doesn't fully get the. Uh, football across the line, shall we say? So, um, well, let's move on to some James Gunn talk here, Jeff. And please keep sending in your streamlabs and super chats as super chats as we go along here. Uh, James Gunn uh, took to Threads this week. That's right, not Twitter, but Threads uh, to answer questions about the DC universe uh, with some fans. I don't know why he does this, but I guess maybe he just enjoys talking to the fans. Uh, and certainly, he's not going to stop doing it, no matter how much, how much you and I may not like it. But he responded to a fan about the canon in DC Universe, and this is what he posted. Nothing is canon until Creature Commandos next year, a sort of aperitif to the DCU. And then a deeper dive into the universe with Superman Legacy after that. It's a very human drive to want to understand everything all the time, but I think it's okay to be confused on what's happening in the DCU since no one has seen anything from the DCU yet. And yes, some actors will be playing characters that they've played in other stories, and some plot points might be consistent with plot points from the dozens of film shows and animated projects that have come from DC in the past, but nothing is canon until Creature Commandos and a Superman Legacy. He also confirmed that Zola Maradueña will be playing Boo Beetle in the future. John Cena will stay as Peacemaker, and Viola Davis will return as Amanda Waller because that series is coming out and she'll be in Creature Commandos. So, Jeff, this feels so self-serving in terms of the quotes what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts as a journalist are what is not there. Wonder Woman 3, well, Aquaman, exactly. these, yeah, Flash, yeah. Uh, I mean, Gal, Gal Gadot not being on that list of yep. characters that are coming back uh, speaks volumes. Um, yeah, James Gunn's going to James Gunn. That's what he does. That's yep. why people love him. He talks to the fans. He's accessible. Uh, yeah. And that makes him relatable and, you know, people want to see his work. So, you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say stop, you know, doing fan outreach or stuff like that. But I, I do wish that he actually would wait until he has something to talk about. I mean, I feel yeah. like we've been hearing these are these three actors. Like, why is this even news? Like anytime James Gunn goes anywhere and says anything, it becomes news. I don't, he's not saying anything new that we didn't know here. Mm -hmm. Um. The whole, like, what is canon, what is canon, that's not an interesting conversation to me. I was never one of these geeks who grew up arguing about Star Wars canon and, and all that stuff. Like, but you do understand it's a big deal for a lot of people. Maybe not for you, but for a lot of fans, it's a I big get deal. It. Okay. But, like, but why? Like, I mean, don't. wouldn't you rather just have, like, a good movie, a good two-hour story, than, and not have to figure out, well, is this canon? Is it not canon? Where does it, you know, like fit into this larger, like, just give me a movie. So what you're saying is you're okay watching the bear and then them randomly do something about some other characters that have nothing to do with the overall storyline of the bear is what you're, you're okay with an episode. That's just like new characters, new, whatever, just for like half an hour. And has nothing to do with the overall story lines that you're following. I'm saying the I series don't need, is canon. I don't need to be the guy who's like, mm, did you guys see Out of Sight? That's Michael Keaton, and he is in the Quentin Tarantino canon because he's playing the same character from... I mean, it's like... Who cares? <laughs> who cares about this stuff? I don't care about canon. Okay. Well, I do, because I think canon is important, especially because they've established that they believe in canon themselves. So I would be okay with it if they didn't say, well, this is what's in the Gunniverse, and this is what is what isn't in the Gunniverse. So essentially implying there is a canon to the Gunniverse. And the reason I call it self-serving is because he's saying, 
it's very human, a uh, very human drive to want to understand everything all the time. He's almost like he's stroking your hair, but I think it's okay to be confused on what's happening. Well, the only reason people are confused is because you're not coming out and saying for sure what the fuck is in and what the fuck is out. You're not even saying that. Why, why gonna... does he owe us these answers? Why can't he just make a movie and have us enjoy it or not enjoy it? People want, want to put stuff. In a people want to put stuff in a construct. People want to understand where you're going. He hasn't said shit about the Wonder Woman three and Gal Gadot coming. I didn't say anything. He still hasn't said anything about her comment. So he's to know where he's going. I just want to see the movie. It's like, why do I need the, his roadmap? Why do I need his directions? I, I need them, and I think a lot of people need them. So we know what to expect going forward. Why do you need to know what to expect? That's what the fucking movie trailers for. In terms of what his plan is and what he's going to do, what we can look forward to seeing who's in and who's out. I think that's important. So you understand. Well, you want to watch in. the movie and find out who's in and who's out. Oh, no. there's a cameo from so and so from from Justice League. Holy shit! No, I Kathleen don't need Kennedy in debrief before the movie. Kathleen Kennedy came in, bought Star Wars, and said very clearly, "Everything we do forward from here is canon. The original trilogy is canon. The prequel trilogy is canon. But all this other shit you've been reading." is legends and we may borrow and put those characters into canon down the road but for now that shit has nothing to do with the main focus that allows people to relax and focus on what you're doing uh now wb is playing it many different ways right because they're having the batman have its own fucking universe and all this and the joker be its own thing as well so all people want to know is who's in and who's out just that simple just make a statement there's no shazam with zachary levi there's no gal gadot with wonder woman you're, you're, there's no momoa you know if, if, like, I don't, no, John, you're wrong. You're so wrong. I'm not wrong. I just have a different opinion than you. If, Go ahead. Yeah. If Wonder Woman is back, mm -hmm. okay, why would you want a statement before she's seen, comes up in some movie? Let's say she's in Superman Legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Why would you want to know that? Why wouldn't you just want to watch Superman Legacy and then, holy shit, there's Gal Gadot? Right. But what does that mean, though, when I see her? Is she now going to be Wonder Woman or is someone else going to be Wonder Woman? And this was a fun cameo in the construct of that movie. I don't know. Why not just wait another year for the next movie to, to then see? I just, I don't. Anyways, we're just two different minds on this because like you said, you're not a person who grew up doing these kinds of things. We're, I am a person who grew 100% up. 100% sure. I, so I, I, just canon, I'm going to ask both my brothers when they come over for dinner tonight, if they even know what the word canon means. I should hope to know what the word can means. Um, and with one N. <laughs> are you okay with uh, Cena and uh, Viola Davis? So this is that's a good things, right? I mean, I like those characters, so I'm glad they're staying. Yeah, I mean, they're relatively new additions. They're not someone yes. who's been playing the character for six, seven years already. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, it, sure. I, I don't need them to, like, reboot it entirely, especially if those are James Gunn's well, I guess Viola wasn't his choice, but but Cena was, right? Cena was definitely his choice, yeah. Right, so like, okay, that's a decision he made. Of course, he wants to yeah. stand by that decision and find, you know, more opportunities to get that character in the larger universe that he's creating. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and I, and I don't need him to like, I didn't need him to get rid of Viola Davis, you know? Right. Like, uh, I mean, she's obviously a great actress and the DCU is lucky to have her. Yes, she's agreed. perfect as a character. So yeah, then, then keep her around. Blue Beetle, sure, he, he was good. That You know, that was... Yeah. A, a breakout performance and um and i do wish that they were, were planning to make a sequel to that i don't think that they will but they could yeah. find him you know things to do within the dcu so i think it's cool that those three will come back but let's say there was a fourth one coming back I, you know yeah i don't need james gunn to tell me who it is we'll just i'll see it when i see it okay all right well this has to be opposite sides on this one um well, let's opposite see sides. this is a podcast baby sometimes you'll say something and i'll say it, i'll agree with you yeah and yeah. I won't even, but I'll, I'll take the opposite side just to make an interesting conversation. No. I got to like, keep you guys on your fucking toes. AZ Badfish says, afternoon, fellas. I'm on the East Coast now, too. I've been keeping up, but this is my first live show since moving to Georgia. Was rough, but so happy to be out of the desert. Thanks for helping with distractions during that stress. Thank you. You're yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank um, you. Let's see. I I am two fly cam says I agree with Jeff. For whatever reason, Washington just doesn't have the draw. His his father does. Boyega is the next Denzel Washington, in my opinion. Also, the names of Luke Han and Leia don't need to be uttered again on the big screen. Move on, unless they give us a Vader film, which you can't do without having Luke and Leia uh, in some way referenced. But uh, 
yeah, Jeff, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think John Boyega is the next Denzel Washington? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think that there is a next Denzel Washington. Mm. Mm. Denzel is is Denzel. Okay. Like, yeah. It's it's the same thing with, you know, every basketball magazine in the 90s and 2000s saying, could Harold Miner be the next Michael <laughs> Jordan? Could Maybe Jordan so be the next MJ? Like, you know, just because uh, these are ta- and both are, are very talented young uh, black actors, John David Washington, yeah. um, you know, is, has an Oscar nomination. Right. Uh, you know, he can be good in the right situation. Boyega is good in getting better. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't think either one of them is. I, I wouldn't put either one of them on the tier of a Denzel. Or so we're about to apparently get a really breakout performance from Coleman Domingo in a new film coming out from Netflix apparently later on this year. So that's that may be another person we throw in the mix as another fantastic black actor in our midst, um, uh, which he already is obviously, but getting in the the attention, you know. Uh, Coleman Domingo is he close to fifty? Yeah, probably, probably. Uh, I'm not going to fault the man. It's, so. it's impossible to tell. Black don't crack, John. That's true. I heard someone say the other day, black don't crack. And then they said, don't worry, Roca. Latin is satin. So now I'm going to use that. Latin is satin. Everybody looks better than white people, basically. <laughs> All white people, we, we, you don't want to see us. Well, you fuckers are richer than everyone else. So take that. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks, Roca and Jeff. Always enjoy your shows, even if Jeff is wrong. <laughs> Any chance we might get a Nost or Jeff sighting over on game time? Well, we'll see. Uh, Jeff's a pretty busy guy. Matt and I are kind of taking a break from each other, so I don't know if that's uh, going to uh, happen, but Matt's always up for coming on the show. I think I could have gotten him and on to talk about the um, the big trade that happened with uh, 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 Damian Lillard over to Milwaukee. Uh, quick thoughts on that, Jeff. Uh, Damian Lillard over to Milwaukee. Drew Holiday over to Milwaukee, but over to um, Portland, but they're probably going to send him on to someone else. So what are your thoughts on this? Dan Lillard's a great player. I think he'll, he'll be a great compliment uh, with, with Giannis. And if it keeps him in town longer, then then you have to do that deal, right? You do whatever it takes yeah. to keep Giannis happy. Um, I don't know if it'll make like a huge difference. I mean, uh, Drew Holiday is, is a pretty good, um, you know, Defender. guard. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Lillard is a, a step up, but, you know, he may also – He's not going to be the alpha anymore, right? Right, right. I mean, Giannis going to have to share that ball. He gets the ball, him, him or Giannis. So there may be chemistry issues. So I, I think, yeah, it's a win for the Bucks for sure. But it's not like a, a home run, go place your bets on the Bucks right now. I think it's still going to be a battle in the East. Plus, he's 33. You know, he's not, there's a situation there, and he may be getting injured more and more as, as these seasons go along playing for the Bucks. And we don't know. We don't know if Giannis is going to sign that extension. If he signs the extension, then those guys are set for the next three years. If he doesn't, then it could be just a one season and Giannis is gone anyway. So we'll see how that works out. I like the move for the Bucks to try it out. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, Haskell says, hey, guys, thoughts on the True Detective trailer? I haven't seen it. Did you see it, Jeff? It looks fucking amazing. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think this season's going to be awesome. I've I been agree. telling you guys for years, years, that Callie Reese is the real deal. Okay. I would not want to run into her in a dark alley. She she's a real pro boxer. Yeah. Uh, and she will kick the shit out of you. And her toughness alongside Jodie Foster, who I, I was watching this trailer and I, I just said it out loud. I'm like, fucking Jodie Foster is so amazing. Yeah. She is not thought of, I don't think, as like one of the greats, even though she has two odds. I'm saying like if you put Kate Blanchett in that role. People would maybe be more excited or, or whatever. Right, like, right, right, right. I'm saying no. Like Jodie Foster is a better actress than Kate Blanchett. Wow. I think. Um, wow. And she does not get her due. Okay. All right. Fair and point. she's amazing in Nyad. I hope she gets a supporting uh, nomination. Yeah. I love Jodie Foster. I think she's been through the wars of that business on so many levels as a woman, as a gay woman, uh, and come out uh, delivering wonderful performances, becoming a fantastic director. And so in the end, yeah, the more work she can get, because she doesn't work a lot nowadays, the more work she can get in front of the camera is a joy for anybody who gets to uh, revisit how great she is and go back and see her stuff. So, yeah, I didn't see the trailer because, honestly, I'm already in. And so I don't want anything ruined for me because I love True Detective and I liked that last season, but I need something that's going to shock my fucking world. And the first two trailers I saw on this one 
I'm already so in for this show. So I don't want to have anything ruined for me. I love that it's a new writer. I mean, yes. this is as and much as I love Nick Pizzolatto and I love what Noah Hawley does on Fargo. And like that is just so a, a, in, like attuned to his sensibility as a writer. Yeah. Of Fargo. Yeah. Pizzolatto and True Detective, like it was this, it was a relationship of diminishing returns, right? right. Like you can't top yourself, then we got to find someone else who, who can try to do it. And it, it, this yeah. is a great title for an anthology show. So I'm very excited. I haven't seen any, I don't think I've seen any of Issa Lopez's work. Actually. You haven't seen Tigers Are Not Afraid? That's definitely no, one I recommend. Didn't. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very excited about someone new and someone like Issa Lopez getting you know, control of that franchise and putting their own spin on it. Yeah. And if you guys want to enjoy a conversation with Issa Lopez, I sat down with her for an hour. It's on this channel, on the Outlaw Nation channel, on the Deep Cut playlist there. Me and Issa talk for an hour about her work as, an, as a director. She's fantastic. I couldn't be happier for her. Go Latinas. Uh, let's see. Joel Davis says, any insight on how far Stephen Knight was with his draft of the Ray New Jedi Order film before the strike? Is he back on writing now post-strike? Uh, I would imagine so, Jeff. He's back writing. But uh, I don't know how far along he was on this because I, I don't think they think I don't think they they see this. This is going to be the first one. So clearly he was probably working on it before they made the announcement that he was coming on to be on the project and moving the other writer off, moving um, uh, Lindelof off of this thing. So I imagine just like with the Haunted Mansion thing, that had been in the works for a while. So what are your thoughts on this? Uh, really haven't gotten, I haven't checked on that project in a while. Okay. Um, I probably should go back to Mr. Star Wars source, but um. Yeah, I feel like the only thing that we've uh, talked about has been um, the f I'm like totally blanking on the Mangold film, the right? The oh, the Filoni film, rather. Is that what you mean? Uh, no, I, I can't. I'm drawing a Star Wars blank. Okay, I know it's been Taika's movie. Taika, oh <laughs> right, yes. because I, I definitely checked in on that. And again, a, a draft is expected. Um, it's not it's dead. Okay. Cooley High says I agree with John. James needs to explain what is canon. He made a statement of everyone else in the universe. I mean, is there a multiverse? So, yeah, see? Yeah, I'm not wrong. I, I just have a different opinion than yours. Gallia Production says, "I, you guys think Vaughn helms the authority for Gunn. Yeah, do you think uh, Matthew Vaughn will helm the authority for James Gunn, uh, uh, Jeff? What are your thoughts on that? And let's move into the Argyle trailer uh, connected to this. Right, so yeah, no, I, have, I have no idea. I mean, obviously, there's been rumors tying Matt Vaughn to the yeah. DCU. Um <sighs> I don't know why he would want to go play in another filmmaker sandbox. You're like, you're yeah. fucking Matt Vaughn. Go create your own fucking sandbox. You don't, you don't need James Gunn and, and the leftovers that James Gunn doesn't want to direct. Um, like, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's how, that's how I kind of feel. I, I, you know, unless, I mean, wouldn't Matt Vaughn like want, uh, I don't, I don't know what, what goes through Matt Vaughn's brain. I don't know if he wants like to, to work with the marquee characters or if he likes sort of, creating somebody new like these characters that we're going to meet in the author in the authority right they're going to yeah, be yeah. new to big screen audiences maybe that is what he gets you know his kicks out of but yeah. um i don't know i'd like to see matthew vaughn go and do something else to be honest okay. um the same way that guy Ritchie, even though you know, i mean sherlock holmes had some elements of his work aladdin was sure. a complete change of pace the covenant this year was a complete yeah. change of pace. i'd like to see what the complete change of pace is for matthew vaughn moving away from these kinds of you know, big fun action spy movies and stuff. Well, speaking of action spy movies, the first trailer for Matthew Vaughn's Argyle uh, came out today after that terrible teaser trailer from two days ago with a horrible CGI cat. Uh, but this one is coming out on February 2nd, 2024. Uh, it's uh, and this is the, the film here that Apple is doing. And they released the first trailer today. Henry Cavill in this uh, as well with Bryce Dallas Howard, Dua Lipa doing some action. Uh, Sam Rockwell, Brian Cranston, uh, and here's the log line. Bryce Dallas Howard is Ellie Conway, the reclusive, reclusive author of a series of best-selling espionage novels whose idea of bliss is a night at home with her computer and her cat Alfie. But when the plots of Ellie's fictional books come to life, which center on a secret agent, Argyle, and his mission to unravel a global spy syndicate, they begin to mirror the covert actions of a real-life spy organization. Quiet evenings at home become a thing of the past. Also, John Cena, Catherine O'Hara, Ariana DeBose, and Samuel L. Jackson. Jeff? I loved this trailer. What did you think? I also really liked the trailer. Um, but I can see why my source several months ago yeah. 
said that Apple doesn't really know what to do with the movie. So I think I'm going to tell my my story now. I'm not going to. Okay. I'll leave out some details and stuff like that. But all right. I think it was in August. Should we have music for this? Well, maybe it was even before then. Maybe it was like June or July. But I, I forget when the fuck it was. I got a call. Um, it was like four in the afternoon, four thirty in the afternoon. Got a call from a British phone number, and I. I call, uh, I answered, and it was Matt Vaughn. Oh! Um, and you know, I don't want to betray his confidence, but it, it was it actually the conversation meant a lot to me. So Matt Vaughn was like, "Listen, you know, I, I, it got back to me what you said on your podcast that Apple kind of has no idea what they're doing, right? Uh, or they or they're unsure of how to market it. Like they don't know what they have on their hands, and right? Kind of was like." I'm asking if you believe your source, if you trust your source. You don't have to tell me who your source is. Right. But I kind of get the same feeling. Yeah. And I was about to embark on a spiritual journey, if you will, Ooh. Ooh. Uh, that I needed to embark on. And it was, it meant a lot to me, the call, because it, here's this guy mm -hmm. who was a multimillionaire. Yes. He's directed huge, successful movies that have actually yes. been good. Uh, he's married to one of the world's biggest models. Claudia yes. Jones. And here is this guy who is up again. If I'm getting the call in LA at four four thirty, he's up at twelve twelve thirty, you know, one a.m. With, with the time difference, whatever. Right, right. He's up, couldn't sleep, and he was stressing out, and he and wow. he felt bad that he, as a director, yes, didn't know what was going to happen with his movie. Wow! But couldn't tell Brian Cranston or you know Henry Cavill these yeah. these guys what's going to happen to their work? Is it going to go to theaters or just going to get kicked to streaming? Right. Um, and I connected with him on this really kind of profound level where it's like everybody's got shit, mm -hmm. right? Even this rich, successful director is still up in the middle of the night calling yeah. me for some reason because he is nervous and, and yeah. has fears and and. Um, so anyways, I, I'm really thrilled for Matthew that he did get a theatrical release in the end. Yeah, it's, you know, in February, mm -hmm. which is, you know, seen sometimes as something of a, a dumping ground. Yeah. Um, I, but having seen the trailer, I, I can understand what he was getting at, which is that yeah. this is a very complicated movie. Uh, it's basically stranger than fiction, like, mm -hmm. with eyes. Right, and, and so I think that there was um, some questions about you know how, how to sell it and and uh, how, how to you know I, I think even the fact that the teaser trailer came out what was it two days ago yeah Tuesday yeah yeah, yeah. and then they said the trailer tomorrow right yeah. mm -hmm. and then it didn't come right like yes. there's something where it's like they're not quite sure what to do with this movie but um I think it looked awesome. Yeah, uh, it, it, the, the cast is super fun. I like the premise. I like that it's something different. Yeah. And in my conversations with Matthew, he said there are moments in this movie that will leave your jaw on the floor. Wow. He said there are certain, you know, whether it's his approach to action or, or just certain action beats or whatever. He, you know, he's yeah. he promised a few things that are like this is going to like blow the hair back on your head. Wow. So um, I'm really looking forward to Argyle, uh, and I appreciate that Matt, Matt Vaughn, and I hope he doesn't feel like I'm betraying his confidence here, um, took the time to to call me and have that conversation. Yeah. And again, just because it was very humanizing. You think that yeah. these guys are, 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 you know, on top of the world and have everything at their fingertips. And, and no, they, they, they live lives of uncertainty just like the rest of us. Yeah. 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 I'm a big fan of Matthew Vaughn. So, you know, since Layer Cake on, I've enjoyed seeing his work and, and liking what he does. And this trailer I was a little nervous about because it was an interesting collection of actors. I didn't sure what you're going to get out of this, but I really liked it. Uh, and because I didn't like that teaser trailer, I was like, oh, man, what is that? And then, boom, this one dropped. And this was a lot of fun. Great to see Sam Rockwell this far in his career getting a chance to kind of be this kick-ass spy kind of guy like we kind of got a glimpse of it, uh, as Justin Hammer in the Iron Man 2 movie. And seeing Cavill having some fun here with Dua Lipa. This has shades of Lost City. So if I was them, I would look at what Lost City did, which made good money, and kind of follow that path. Because it's essentially kind of the same story where she's writing a romance thing that comes to life, a romance novel that comes to life. In this situation, it's Bryce Dallas Howard writing spy thrillers, 
that come to life. But you can use the same kind of marketing tactics to get people on board because books are huge. People still read books, whether it's electronically or the physical media of the books. And so this idea of appealing to people who enjoy and write books and having their stories come to life could be really interesting for a lot of people. There's a nice charm to this trailer, nice humor to this trailer as well. And I like the idea of all these different um, fantastic actors being a part of this thing. And it looks fun. Number one, it looks fun and exciting. Uh, and if Matthew's right about some of these scenes uh, putting your jaw on the floor, that makes me even more excited to see this movie for I sure. Mean, there, so, there, yeah. there are moments like that in Kick-Ass and, and in Kingsman. Mm. And yeah. I get that, you know, the Kick-Ass sequel is not very good. He didn't direct it. Um, right. You know, the Kingsman sequel is, is frankly not very good either. Yeah. But, um, but when he starts something. Yeah. He starts something. You know, like he he delivers. So I I've, I'm a big fan of Matt Vaughn. I am definitely looking forward to this. The cast again is is fantastic, and it's a different kind of spy thriller. It puts a twist on things, and that's all you can ask for these days. Yeah, and he rarely misses. Layer Cake was good. I liked Stardust as a Neil Gaiman adaptation. Kick Ass was good. X Men First Class. A lot of people like that film. Kingsman the first one. Yeah, the sequel not so great. Uh, and then the King's Man. I liked the King's Man for what it was. Yes. I do feel that it was a little bit, there was a lot of editing or some cutting going on here from what they originally were going to do. So you sense that when you watch the movie, but there are some really damn good scenes in that movie overall. So yeah, hopefully Argyle is another uh, a good one on his resume for sure for us to enjoy. Um, all right, well, let's take a quick break, Jeff, and we'll jump into some of this last stuff before we wrap up the show. Keep sending in your Streamlabs and Super Chats. We'll be right back right after this. All right, Jeff, let's get into these rumors about Christopher Nolan possibly becoming the director of James Bond, the next James Bond director. World of Real reported back on September 7th that Christopher, no 7th, that Christopher <laughs> Nolan had been in discussions with James Bond producer Barbara Broccoli to direct the next 007 movie. The deal was for two films, and the deal was being negotiated uh, for Nolan to do that and writing them as well, but no word yet on who would play Bond. But now, recently, there's another uh, a report on this from a person who supposedly, according to them at World of Real, ingrained in Bond Intel, that uh, wh who was right about the Taylor Johnson thing. He pushed he pushed these uh, points of the deal that they're looking at. Eon and Amazon are pushing for Nolan. Eon wants a full reboot for the modern era with Nolan wanting to make adaptations of the Ian Fleming novels. The goal is uh, to get Nolan to do two to three films and then have him executive produce going forward. So essentially, the... Uh, Nolan verse of James Bond. And if they don't get Nolan, they're literally all the way back to the drawing board. Now, JoeBlow.com came out and poured water on this rumor and said that their source tells them that it's a thousand percent fantasy <laughs> and not true at all. So what's the truth, Jeff? What do you think is going on here? Is this going to happen? All right, let's break it down. Uh, do they want Christopher Nolan to direct James Bond? That's a no, that's a no brainer. Yes, right? 100%. Like, yeah, of course, of course they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, why wouldn't you want Chris Nolan to direct James Bond? So, Especially after a $900 million blockbuster that is out there for people to watch. Now, the question is, does Chris Nolan want to do James Bond? Yeah, I think he does. Okay. I think he, I think he would. I think, I think he does. Now, we talk about, okay, so there's interest on both sides. I would direct this movie under certain circumstances, and we would let you direct this movie under certain yeah. circumstances, circumstances. The question is whether those circumstances align. Yeah. And I don't think that they do. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that, I think Nolan will want complete creative freedom to do whatever he wants. I'm going to cast whoever I want. This is, I'm, I want to do the period, uh, you know, settings and, and the old Fleming novels and all this stuff. Hmm. I don't think that Amazon or the Broccoli's want to do that. I think they want nope. to keep Bond in the modern era. Yep. Right off the bat, that's a pretty big, like, creative differences sort of thing. And you have to keep in mind, this is, you know, as as great as Nolan and a lot of other directors are, like, Broccoli's don't give a shit. Yeah. They, they, they will kick you to the curb. So, like, oh, we've got Danny Boyle? We don't care. You're fired. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so what I'd heard... Was that way back years ago? Mm -hmm. Nolan pitched Barbara a trilogy, a Bond trilogy. Yes. Oh wow! And she passed. 
because he wanted all these things that you don't get on James Bond, including Final Cut, Control, all that kind of stuff. Um, This does feel like the best chance he's going to have. Yeah. You know, to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So my source wouldn't be stunned if he went back to her and was like, hey, you remember that trilogy like I pitched you? I understand maybe the timing wasn't right. You don't want to do it. But like, what about now? Um, and and maybe we could just do two films or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is. I still don't think that she's going to go give into his demands and give him the leeway to make whatever he wants. So it's like without that leeway, does he take the gig? I can't, I don't really see it. I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think it will happen because I don't think that the broccolis are, are ready to give up that control. And, and I imagine she's already giving up not necessarily creative control, but certain control over certain things with the, with the project going to Amazon. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, the, Amazon bought MGM for bond. Really, yeah. Right. And it's like, they are going to want to have some say uh, in certain things, even if they, you know, um, don't have the creative say. So, right. but, you know, but it's like, and again, Chris Nolan, he he's defending the theatrical experience. So like, does he want to work for a streamer? Not that this movie would ever debut on prime video or something, yeah. but like what, you know, what kind of theatrical exclusivity is he going to want? And what does prime video want? Does prime video want the movie on prime video a month after it's in theaters or will they let this go for three or five months? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's those kinds of questions. So my gut feeling is it won't work out. I think it was more possible before Oppenheimer. And I think now with Oppenheimer, Nolan has much more leverage in this kind of a situation. Because look, before Oppenheimer, the last two or three films of Nolan weren't doing were regret making progressively less at the box office. You can't you can't say that with, with Tenet with the pandemic. That's obvious. That's like a big asterisk. Fine. But the other movies were Dunkirk didn't do as well as like in Inception or so or the or the Batman movie. So you look at that kind of a situation. Maybe there's a there was a little bit of bloom off the rose. But after this Oppenheimer situation, if you're Nolan, I don't know how you don't go in there and say, "I need to have final cut. This needs to be mine. You are the producers, but you need to trust me that I will take care of your baby. I will take care of him and deliver something really magical." Because and maybe a conversation with Sam Mendes, who is of course his own uh, man as well, and likes to do things his own way. I think a conversation with him could be very interesting to the two filmmakers to maybe uh, smooth some of the concerns Nolan might have over the situation. But yeah, I'd be surprised if he does it, especially if they don't agree to his concessions. But I would love it, because why not? We've had 45 different fucking Batmans with people having their own points of views on it. So why not trust a filmmaker like Nolan that he's going to... Uh, deliver you a fantastic trilogy of Bond films that are going to elevate your character even more. But I don't want to see a period piece. I don't. I put it modern, make it modern. Anytime they try to go back in time with any of this shit, it never makes money. So uh, to me, I, I would absolutely keep it modern. It doesn't make any sense. You know? um, all right. So let's move on here to the Ava DuVernay story. You wanted to put this in, Jeff. Uh, uh, this, do you want to lead us through this one? Yeah, no, so Ava DuVernay and um, Netflix are, are sort of uh, wrapped up in this big lawsuit right now from Linda. Is it Fair? Fairstein? Fairstein. Right. Uh, Fairstein. Okay. Um, who is the, the prosecutor in uh, When They See Us, which is the mm-hmm. Central Park Five limited series that, that Ava made for Netflix. Um, she's played by Felicity Huffman. Mm-hmm. And she's very much cast as like the villain of the piece. Right. Which, you know, in real life, I think it wasn't so simple. Um, right. She claims it was not. She didn't do the stuff that they had right. Felicity Huffman doing. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I do think that artists need to be allowed to take artistic license um, and stuff like that. But also, if you're taking such artistic license where, like, it's really affecting this woman's life and her career. Because she you know, lost her. She, right. Her publishing it's, company dumped her. Right. After the uh, series came out, yes, right. It's like it's like, yeah, there that, that that may be a problem. Like, why not have why not just change the name? That's what I don't get. Like, oh, I get yeah. you're telling a true story, but like, if you want to take some creative licenses or embellish certain things for the sake of drama, which I think you should totally be allowed to do, right? May, maybe change the name, um, because she was kind of scapegoated. Uh, mm-hmm. and again, I don't know that 
the, you know, I think Ava DuVernay can also should be able to rely on audiences to be like, hey, this is a TV show. It's not a documentary. Like, don't right. go believing right. every word of this. Right. Uh, the problem, the problem is some of the, is malice, mm -hmm. right? If you if you aren't necessarily trying to hurt someone or, or tell some things like the, the, an intentionally false way, like it's tough to be held accountable. Right. But you know, upon discovery, there there were text messages that Ava DuVernay sent, uh, or you know, maybe it was a tweet or whatever it was, but it was like she kind of had a feeling that this was not going to end well for Linda. And she went ahead and did it anyways, it almost as like a way to retry the case or, or get justice for these boys. Um, and I don't think that that is, that should necessarily be the point of art. I mean, it's, it doesn't mean it, it can't have those real life effects. I mean, you look at the paradise uh, lost trilogy, like that guy yeah. yeah. off of death row and stuff. So like, yes, art as activism, I think has a place, but I'm not, that's documentary. And I'm not sure right. that a narrative show, like when they see us should have taken the licenses that it's accused of taking. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the situation uh, now when you look at it, um, because she, the judge is a uh, federal judge named Kevin Castle, who has ordered Netflix to go to trial over this. Uh, and the, as you said, the doc, the discovery here, there's quite a lot of interesting tidbits in the discovery. And we're getting this from Matt Baloney. Uh, who wrote a really in-depth uh, article on this on his Puck site. Uh, you guys should join. A lot of great stuff on that site there. Matt, Matt's um, a former lawyer, so I think that he yeah. understands the legal issues about this in a way that, you know, I never could. Yeah, Linda Fairstein is portrayed as being obsessively biased against Black and Latino teens, even calling them, quote, animals in the script, in the show, and overlooking inconsistencies in their confessions. But when 2020 did a breakdown of this situation linda was barely in that break two hour breakdown of this situation that apparently was what started to give some of the people pause about it but as you said ava just uh, powered through it and i get it look ava DuVernay is trying with her with her work to, in her so her activist work in in terms of media to show how these situations have been biased against black people in our country and i think that's totally fair but by the same token you can't do the same thing to someone who didn't do these things and essentially accuse them falsely of doing things they didn't do if you don't have hard evidence of them doing it. I don't care if they're white, black, or purple. You've got to be responsible to those people as well. And don't even be like, well, other white people. Yeah, those white people go and vilify them. But if this white person didn't do that and she didn't say these things and she didn't lead the investigation and she wasn't the villain... I think there's a mistake being made here. And especially if it's going to cost her her livelihood, her, she was a, a, a novelist, a, 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 a thriller novelist, and all that kind of stuff. Then that's real world effects, right? Like Cinderella Man, they portrayed Max Baer as this unstoppable killer. Uh, and the truth was, he was actually a really nice guy. He accidentally killed a couple of people in the rings because he's just a boxer. And But they vilified him. And Ron Howard got called out for this. And Max Bayer's family came out of this. A lot of people came out against this. Max Bayer's dead at the time. That's not, it's not the same thing. Right. This woman is very exactly. much still alive. That, yeah. That's a good point that you just made. Max Bayer was dead and this woman yeah. was still alive. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's okay yeah. for Cinderella Man to have, to have made Max Bayer out to be this unstoppable killing machine. Right. Not that he intentionally killed anybody in the ring. It's just, you know, that's uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of boxing. Um, right. But yeah, th th this is a different case. And if you wanted to sort of make her as like the, the stand in white villain for a whole bunch of racism and, and just issues that New York City was dealing with at that at that time. Yeah, maybe yeah. just change the name. Yeah, th that's happened all the time in, in uh, based on a true story right. films or TV series. They make an amalgamation of one character and but make that person stand in for. I don't like though that how like the publisher you know watches this show or mm. maybe they didn't even see it themselves and they just see like the the social yeah. media fallout and they can't they cancel her publishing deal. Like, can't we be adult enough to to recognize like are is this something I have to pay attention to and take seriously or is this just yeah. like noise that's going to blow over in in a couple days? I don't know. I think it's always a case by case basis, right? Maybe that right. publisher saw that her books weren't doing well anymore anyway and found that this was a great way to kind of release her or maybe they felt this was really going to affect them across the board financially and they did what they needed to do because 
You look at the 70s show. We just had a guy convicted for 30 years of raping multiple women and sexually. But no one is taking down that 70s show. But they took the Cosby show down like that. But they're not taking down that 70s show. Why is that? So I think it's always a case-by-case basis and depending on the companies and what's involved financially for them in all of this, unfortunately. There's no yeah. consistency, Jeff. Again, when I was in the the you know the the news cycle at Mashable for my yeah. Oscar column, it was like I don't know. I could I could still be writing for Mashable now, uh, and and but rather than you know put try to like you know build and put stock in that relationship, they're just like oh we'll cut ties after three or four months because we can't deal with an internet controversy for more than twenty four hours. Right. Like, they couldn't wait for it to blow over, so we just have to take action. And look, we've cut the tumor out. We've exercised. We've excised him, and it's like, yeah, you guys are fucked. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right, let's move on to Golden Globe categories here, Jeff. We've got two new Golden Globe categories. What are your thoughts on these uh, stand-up comic and blockbuster categories? What are your thoughts on these? I mean, I didn't even write about it because I really have, have done my best to try to stop covering the Globe so much because okay. it is, it's so ridiculous. I don't even know who they are anymore. If We're not even talking about those 90 journalists. They added a whole bunch of other members some are voting some are non-vote it makes yeah. it makes no sense um they also kicked out some members who were involved with some nefarious right stuff exactly. they bring in they bring in people for diversity and, and that kind of stuff and it's like oh yeah you are you add diversity the diversity of the point of view of an anti-semite <laughs> uh whoops a daisy yeah i think that this was kind of an inevitable an inevitability. The Globes had to do maybe something to, to shake it up and remind people that they still exist. I mean, they still don't have a TV deal. So I guess if you're not on TV, do, will people even know? I think yeah. the, the, the popular movie idea, the bar, the one that's based on box office, that award is maybe designed to, to, to appeal to TV broadcasters to say, Hey, take our show because we're going to have this award. And, you know, it's not just going to be awarding a whole bunch of movies. Nobody's ever heard of, which is right. you know, oftentimes what the Oscars is. I think this is very much a, we're giving Barbie a, a best picture statue. <laughs> um, they might, well, might as well have just announced it. And I think that's where the majority of like social media sentiment was. It was about that box office award. Mm -hmm. That's not my concern here, John. And we, okay. we'll, we'll get to you and, and yours. But mine is the sure. comedy thing. Yeah, the stand-up comedy. Yep. You're telling me that these international journalists are suddenly going to be able to – I mean, I don't even know yeah. if they're interested in comedy. Who, who knows? Yeah. Uh, or if they have any sense of co comedy history or, or, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. And, like, these people are certainly not going to be qualified to judge stand-up comedy albums. Not to mention, yeah. like, comedy <laughs> – can be problematic. Shane Gillis, I get why people consider him to be problematic. Sure. I also think he's one of the funniest people on the planet right now. Is mm -hmm. his? Are you telling me that special is going to be up for consideration? Like, what happens no. if it gets nominated? And what? Like, what's the outcry with that special? Right. Um, and you know, there's a lot of specials that, whether they say racist things or gay jokes or whatever it is, like, mm -hmm. you're telling me that these are going to be up for Golden Globes? I mean, I, I hope so, but that's not the feeling that I get. I have a feeling it's going to be safe cookie cutter. Yeah. bullshit um and just like the completely wrong group of people to be awarding what now becomes one of the biggest comedy prizes in the country i suppose i don't know you know it shouldn't be looked at that way but it probably will be yeah no i, I don't disagree with you i think it's ridiculous and, and here's the qualifications for the uh the first one that jeff was mentioning the golden globe for cinematic and box office office achievement eligible nominees will uh, have grossed at least $150 million during release and $100 million of which must have come from domestic box office. Streaming films with commensurate viewership will be considered based on data from recognized industry sources, whatever that means. On eight films that means American eligible. movies, basically, by the way. Yeah, and eight films will be eligible for that prize. To me, this feels like you're turning it into the MTV Movie Awards. It's like, is a golden popcorn going to be given to you for this kind of thing? And it's ridiculous to me on so many levels. Because you know it's a waste of a fucking award. If I'm not winning best picture, what the fuck is this best picture that made $150 million nonsense? It's really not the, anything but to soothe uh, egos or whatever. And you're right. It's about selling the show so more people will watch because their Barbie thing might win, Barbie film might win, which is a damn good movie. But still, in the end, it feels like you're catering to um, the wrong type of film fan, in my opinion, because I think this is stupid and the award means nothing the stand-up thing i think you're absolutely right to have an issue with 
no fucking way are these people watching hours and hours and hours right. of stand-up material to decide what is the right one to win and what should win, what shouldn't win. Even if you pared it down to seven or eight nominees or five or six even, I guarantee you there are a bunch of journalists who don't want to watch stand-up because, hate to break it to you, a lot of people don't actually like stand-up and don't watch stand-up. And so this thing that the, so to me that's ridiculous as well i can't you wait had a, for these nominees. i cannot yeah. wait for what for the cop for the comedy nominees yeah you know, for the nominees right <laughs> be all these milk toast nominees for sure but yeah who knows because Chappelle, you could argue Chappelle, i mean but Chappelle had said the controversy with his most recent stuff so would that be in consideration would it not it's, and it's, how do you feel as a be, studio it's gonna be big names pushed by the streamers right these big right, right. streaming specials yeah uh, like Chris Rock will get nominated, right? For for that last one that he did live, uh, probably. But maybe right. I don't know. It's not, good. it's not not a good special, right? It's not, not a really funny. Yeah, Chris Rock's best specials, but that'll get nominated simply because of who he is and, and who put it out. Right, and that's fucked up. And not to mention the fact that these are this is an international group. So yeah. why are we placing emphasis on domestic box office? So when you have a gigantic mm, good point. Head, Right, yeah. like the Battle of Lake, whatever the fuck it was uh, right. in China, that made like eight hundred or nine hundred million dollars, but didn't gross a hundred million here. You're not eligible for the box office award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be the very fucking kind of movie <laughs> that is eligible for the box office award coming from this organization of international journalists? You think. Yeah, yeah. You the whole think. the whole thing is fucked. Yeah. Again, I don't have anything personal against Jay Pensky, but like, you you don't need your fingers in all these pies. And, and you didn't see any criticism about these awards from the trades. Oh, of course not, because Pensky no, runs all the trades. Whatsoever. Not one Twitter, yeah. journal, not one tweet, because yeah. everyone knows where their bread is buttered. And that's why you can't trust the trades. You can't have the trades covering the town and production and projects and award shows when your boss fucking does that shit. Well, I need to ask you to to be clear about this, because at the beginning of our show, you said, I don't like the fact that they're vilifying the trades covering the strike. So do you think in certain ways, in certain situations, certain topics, you should read the trades, but in other topics, you shouldn't trust the trades. Is that what you're saying? When it comes to, I just want you to clarify when it, yes, when it comes to the golden globes mm -hmm. or, or awards in general, South by Southwest okay, or anything else that Penske owns. Right. Right. Why would you be able to trust the trades? Are they yeah. going to criticize him? Are they going if South by Southwest next year and the lineup sucks? Yeah. Is Riley gonna say there's no movies here? The South by Southwest lineup sucks. This festival is toast. Like, right. I mean, now that's not the case, you know, but like what if it was? Would they say that? No, they wouldn't. Simply yeah. because Penske isn't, you know, bought the show. So it, and it's just I, I get that. I get that you can't, you know, you you recuse yourself, or you should recuse yeah. yourself, but an entire publication can't. Right. Um, they can't not cover the Globes. They can't not cover South by Southwest. And so they can only cover it the one way that they're allowed, which is positively. Well, this is what frustrates me when you read people in the trades who have these really vilifying columns or go after these things and they seem sanctimonious <laughs> or righteous or self-righteous when they go after these things because that's a safe thing that they're allowed to go after. Right. But another thing they won't go after because – Penske Media is involved, or Penske has made it clear that you can't talk about certain things. You know, I've had that experience with someone who owns a certain thing and telling you you can't talk about certain things. It is fucking frustrating, or telling you you should only cover it this way. And it's like, fuck you, man. Let us be independent if we're going to be independent. You can't just not call something out because it hurts your feelings. It's got to be available, it's got to be open to everything. So, yeah, in that kind of a situation, it is frustrating to deal with that because then there's no, it, there's a loss of enough authenticity. And that's probably why some of these people who get paid what they get paid at these outlets, and sometimes it's six figures, shut their fucking mouths about certain things because their silence has been bought. Yet they want you to look at them as these, these people who defend the honor of the film industry or TV or movies or whatever. And it's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. If you're not free to say what you really think about these things and you work for an outlet and you're stopped from saying it and you agree to it, you are complicit in that situation and you should absolutely not have your opinion valued in any way, shape or form on that particular subject. So it's just frustrating on so yeah, many levels. It's, it's, 
it's tricky being a journalist, you know, because there's already not a lot of money in it. And yeah. when you get a job that does pay money, like you want to hold on to it for dear life. But I'm yeah. telling you, some of these jobs, yeah, you have to you have to compromise. It, uh, it breaks my heart to see some of the people that I used to respect and admire and read when I find out that they are not allowed to do certain things or talk about certain things. And they do it because their salary is on the line. And it's I, like, I still say that the, big, the biggest example of this is like, you know, I'll do respect to Richard Rushfield and, and the Ankler. Like they they mm. but they took Penske to task for taking that Saudi money. Yes. Yes. Now there are all kinds of ads on the Ankler for Neo. Yeah. Right. Which is yeah. yeah. I mean, come yeah. on. Like, and I know Richard didn't want to take those ads. Right. But that's the reality of the business is he's got mouths to feed. And, and so, you know, and that is where the money is. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it it, 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 it it bleeds from sadly, it bleeds uh, even into the studios. Like from what I understand, the studios have become even more. Um, how can I say this? Intense in pressuring these trades to not say negative things about their work or about their content. Uh, and I've heard about a writer who wrote negative reviews about a certain project and the boss had to go hat in hand and apologize to the studio when the studio had an issue with it. And that's madness to me. And you're, you're literally, it's a review. Allow the reviewer to say what they actually feel about right. it. And you as a studio, shut the fuck up and take it. That's the game. That's the goddamn game. So it's, uh, it's, it's tricky because you, you have to play the game. And so like... Uh, well, I that's mean, why I don't play the game, and I sit out here. Yeah, go so ahead. I've been doing more like junket type interviews. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think of myself as as a junketeer uh, like some right. of these people. Um, but I've been doing more of these interviews because you know we've had to make cuts at, at ATL and can't afford to to pay people to to do these interviews. So I do them myself now. Yeah, and, like I did one with Susanna Fogel this week. Oh um, yeah, director of Cat Person, which comes out soon. Yes, and it's like. You know, I, I had a question written down that I didn't ask her uh, because, oh. you know, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't, you know, it just didn't. That's fair. Yeah. So the question was basically like what she thought of Mila Kunis. She directed Mila Kunis in The Spy Who Dumped Me. Right. Um, and I was just going to like, well, what did you think of Mila's, you know, whole thing with Masterson uh, and the apology? Because I, I want, you know, because this is a movie cat person about yeah. scent and, and things like that. So I do feel like it was That's a fair question, questions, yeah. but I didn't ask it. And I felt bad that I didn't ask it, but I also felt like, again, I, I'm dealing with like a 15 to 20 minute window. You, you, know, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. can't control how long their answers are going to go for either. But like, I didn't ask the question because I was just like, do I really want to go down that road in this interview that's trying, the, the purpose of this interview is to, you know, generate interest in cat person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it was a regret that I had. Right. And I have to live with that regret. Um, but at the same time, I understand still that trade journalists have a job to do and mm -hmm. that may not be the job, right? Yeah. Um, oh, so. no, I don't have a problem if you don't do that. Like, if you don't criticize anything, that's right. consistent. My thing is, if you're going to go off on a column or go on your show sponsored by your outlet and say negative things about certain things, but not say negative things about other things because you want to maintain your connection with that actor or that studio or that director, or you've been told by your boss to not talk negatively about this, then imagine how little I give a fuck about your opinion. Right, everything's suspect. About other exactly. things. Yeah, exactly, because you're not real. You're, at it's that point, you're not question your entire credibility, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that is what I'm getting at when I brought up the Guillermo del Toro, Stephen King stuff. Right, All right let's move how on to it. Yeah. headlines have I read in the last year, or however many years? Guillermo del Toro loves yeah. this, praises this. Yes. Stephen King loves this movie. You know, I mean, can you guys not like one thing? Just just say one thing sucks, and then I'll take you know more into consideration what you think is good. But basically, these guys are just like shills for you know. I mean, Stephen King is just a shill for horror. So if anybody yes. suggests something that, that that is vaguely horror related, he's going to say, "Oh, this this was so good." You know, like listen, horror is the the genre with the biggest pieces of shit. You, if you take a look at my, like the word, like my, you know, the insider yeah. at .com rankings and, and yeah. the bad movies under every year, most of those bad movies are going to be genre movies. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But every single one that comes out seems to be a masterpiece, according to Stephen King or Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> so I don't know. I just, 
I, I don't know why editors like why is this news when one of these guys goes on Twitter and praises something just because yeah. they're a master of horror. If you just know someone's likes and not their dislikes, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> well, I think we can look at it two ways. <laughs> One, if they don't talk about a horror film, it's because they didn't like it. <laughs> so that's the balance. If they talk about a horror film, it's because they did. You can put that inherently in the thing. Yeah, that, no, dude, that's like the backwards, <laughs> like fucking modern critic thing. Where like, and I'm not gonna name names on that, but I think oh, you can take a few fucking guesses. Yeah, yeah people yeah. who love everything. And then they say, oh, well, if I don't like something, I just don't talk about it. Yeah. yeah. What? That's not criticism. <laughs> That's. Dude, like, I, I fucking cannot stand where we're at critically in this fucking. No, movie. I agree. And it's what the studios want. It's what the studios want. They right. want you to be beholden to them. If you like it. Just say something if you like it. It's okay just... to make that deal every now and then. Right, right. right. You know, course, like, oh, we're, we're letting you see this movie so early. Like, try not to, you know, if you, if you don't like it, maybe just don't say anything. I'll be like, okay. On the DL. You can't do that for every movie. Right, right. I, I've never had that experience, but I, I think I would bristle at an experience like that if I had that, that, that. And I've been to these films, dude, and I, you know, you know I do. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird situation because I remember years ago I got shit for saying uh, how I didn't think the horror genre had that many great movies in it, and I was forever vilified as a person who doesn't like horror. That's not true. And I've tried to fight this on every possible moment that I can. I like I liked No One Will Save You. That was fucking great. I enjoy the shit out of that. Let's talk about this movie. Okay. I enjoy the shit out of this. Caitlin Deaver here, Brian Duffield, the director. So I do like good horror. There's just, as Jeff said, a lot of shitty horror movies. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's down for sale. No one's paying me. Okay, this is what this is a relationship based <laughs> business. So, you know, if it if it helps a relationship, you know, yeah. th then again, you have to weigh the the pros and cons and, and and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, no one will save you. This is again one of these movies that gets inexplicably praised to the high heavens by Boy. critics. Because it does something different, and I give Brian Duffield credit for that, yeah. and I think Caitlin Deaver is a very good actress. Yes, uh, but like this is a short film. <laughs> this is a short film stretched to feature length. Oh. There is, you know, it, it does the talk to me thing, where at the very end, like in the last 20, 30 minutes, it tries to give you like some sentimental, goopy story, so, mm -hmm. you know, to put some drama into it or whatever. It just doesn't fit. It's like that's not why I'm watching. Um, I, I really, again, really like the first thirty minutes, but after that, it just runs the, the concept wears out. Uh, I thought the last thirty minutes of this movie were like a total mess. Um, no, not nothing. Nothing could save it for me. Uh, Jeff, you ignorant slut. Uh, no, I don't say this. I really liked it. I enjoyed it. I liked the pacing that it went. I like what we got with Caitlin Deaver and the surprise of what's going on here and that backstory of hers such an interesting thing to approach it where there's only one line that is spoken in the movie one line and i think let's talk about that to keep people's attention for 90 minutes i think is really difficult when there's only one line spoken and i actually uh, appreciated that and like that and that ending i kind of fucking loved that ending to be honest with you so uh go ahead what do you want to talk about the one line I like the idea of the dialogue free movie in okay. theory works but in okay. execution it did not i mean you have scenes where she's going to a police station yes right to ostensibly say something yes Nothing gets said people see her I mean, it's like you're watching a silent film it's yeah, like this yeah. is not how reality works but that's the point of the movie it's playing with the construct look 1917 is one entire take that's not how reality works either so it does. I, when I leave this bedroom, I'm going to go live my life in one continuous take. Yes, but you're not going to see what's in the other rooms that you just left, which is what happens in 1917. I just did not buy this dialogue-free premise at okay. all. It felt like such a gimmick and okay. it just something like a screenwriter's invention to make their, their script stand out. Um, I, I didn't buy it at all. Even just her like hiding from the alien, not being like, oh, fuck, oh, shit. You know, like like any one of us would do i didn't buy it for a second it was it felt but you've so already cool. seen but you've already seen that so this was a new approach to something like that without the fuck shit oh my god reaction that you would normally have yeah yeah but i hear you. I, I it didn't work for you i respect that but uh 
<laughs> I'm sorry you're mad at Guillermo and Stephen King for speaking. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. They can like what they like. It's just like, I don't know why editors feel this is news. Why am I reading? If I'm not following oh, Guillermo or Stephen love King, this. why are there 20 million headlines across the web, the movie websites that I read mm-hmm. about them liking this, 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 and this? And that that's just, what is the point of this coverage? That's fair. That's fair. Um, all right, Jeff, we got some Streamlabs Super Chats. Let me take a quick break as we're at the 30-minute mark, and then we'll wrap up the show with these yeah. uh, answering these things right after this. Actually, Jeff, before we go uh, and answer these, we should uh, uh, give a tribute to Michael Gambone, passed away this morning, who took over for Richard Harris, who had passed away during the Harry Potter films uh, as Dumbledore. But, of course, a rich legacy of phenomenal performances both on fi- on film and on tv uh and a guy who really wasn't appreciated as fully as he should have been i think but hopefully now in retrospect and now that he's passed on people really enjoy his ability to play characters of numerous levels of status also good guys bad guys comedies like what paddington all these kinds of things so what are your thoughts on michael game uh, a great British character yeah. actor. Um, again, wasn't a really big Harry Potter guy. So, like, when I heard that Michael Gambon died, I honestly thought of Layer Cake. <laughs> great film. He's I, yeah, great. I went to Layer Cake first, and I'm sure that there's some some other great uh, you know movies um, you know that he's been a part of. But yeah, I, I don't like just think of him as Dumbledore. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously a very talented guy had a hell of a career. Yeah. I mean, I know that that is what he'll be remembered for is that Harry Potter role. Yeah. 82 years old, uh, passed away after suffering from pneumonia, but you know, it been around since the 1960s on stage, uh, and on, uh, camera worked with a number of fantastic actors, including Lawrence Olivier for God's sake. So incredible to see the, uh, breadth of his work and the breadth of his time. And also for the proof that as an older actor, you can find prominence, you know, you can work and work and work all your life. And then boom, all of a sudden you kind of age into this section of your career and people want to work with you in a number of projects. I really liked him as the villain in open range that Kevin Costner Western, which is so damn good, but I also enjoyed him in the, in Paddington. There's lighter touch roles where he has a lot of fun playing, uh, playing into the humor of it all. And of course, as a uh, double door in the Harry Potter films as well, but just uh, sad to see him, but watch his interviews. I mean, he is a great interview e when you watch his stuff. So, uh, our thoughts to his family for sure. All right, let's get into these streamlabs and super chats, Jeff. As we wrap up the show, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, Cali Kid. Any thoughts on the Talking Head? Stop making sense. The reissue from A twenty four here in four K out in theaters. Uh, do you have any interest? Did you see the original? What are your thoughts? Never saw it. Not a huge Talking Heads guy. You can slap A24 on anything these days. It'll make money. <laughs> I, I, I was very lucky that they did a screening uh, for us down here in San Diego. I got to see it in IMAX. It is fucking gorgeous. It's like watching it all over again. And that music, that album, that fucking concert film from Demi, Jonathan Demi, is still timeless, still works, and you will come out of it really, really enjoying it with a new appreciation for the Talking Heads regardless of their issues with uh, each other. Uh, Keltrick Pickens says, since the writer's strike is lifted and are back to work, I'm surprised there hasn't been any big news of writers joining any, any big projects or IPs yet. Jeff, have you heard anything or is it too early? I think it's too early. I yeah, mean, yeah. and and uh, the rap broke some writer news today. Uh, it was in the chat, something about the wild robot. I forgot who actually got the gig. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I think that there will be probably some news on like DC writers that, that trickles out, uh, eventually. Mm. Um, I think there's probably some star Wars stuff too. Probably coming. Yeah. Good point. But, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not surprised. It's not like, you know, like, uh, yeah, we've been on strike for five months and it's finally over. Yay. Here's the job I got five months ago. Like, right. right. You know, like I, I think. There needs to be a little bit of like an acclimation period, like a little. Yeah, you don't need people ju- jumping out. Writers going like, "Oh, I just got signed for this," because it's not true. They've been. Negotiating I wasn't swinging at all these five these last five yeah. months. I got hired in April on the Star Wars movie. Oh, I don't yeah. like that's what they're looking for. <laughs> you want to let things settle down for a bit. Uh, Empire fan nineteen eighty says, "R.I.P. Michael Gambone, who played Dumbledore." We just talked about him. Thank you, Empire fan. Uh, Keltrick Pickens also said, "I don't think John is much of a horror lover." See where did this. Fucking narrative come from. I'm oh, so it's sick. true. 
Perry, it's Perry's fault. I love you, Perry, but you fucked me over on this for years it. now. Uh, but she said, but it's not true. I like horror. I love horror. Even oh, some horror. See, are you going to see Saw X? Yes, I have a, a, a Fandango code for it. I'm going to see it this weekend. So, did you see it? You got a Fandango? What, did the studio give you a Fandango code? Jeff, did you go see it? Or did you go see it? <laughs> no, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, okay. I'm excited to see it. If I can, after family dinner tonight, I may go tonight. Ooh, wow. Because I have not missed an opening night at the Saw franchise ever, I don't think. This one's getting good reviews. For, it's getting uh, really good reviews. I'm yeah. pumped. I think it looks really good. Yeah. Uh, but if I have to see it tomorrow, I will. I, I can't imagine waiting beyond tomorrow to see it. I'm yeah, so fair. pumped. I love the franchise, even though it's mostly garbage. I will probably go see it in the afternoon on Saturday. Uh, he says, I don't think John is much of a horror lover, but I know Jeff is. Jeff, have you heard anything in terms of who will win Halloween Night's Bidding War? Halloween Rights oh, Halloween Bidding War. Rights Bidding War. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I saw that that story, Bloody Disgusting, did it. Um, hmm. It was between A24 and, and Miramax. Uh, I don't even I don't know what what the situation is with the Halloween rights. I, like, are they owned outright by? They're owned by the Akkads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, so I guess Miramax doesn't have control over them. Um, I mean, if A twenty four wants your rights, I feel like with what they've done on TV, yeah. you should let them do it. Especially if this is a series in which like a bunch of young people get murdered. Um, yeah. like that's what A twenty four does. They they, they get young people together and they kill them in cool ways and uh yeah you know slap a cool soundtrack on it so that sounds like a, a, an interesting approach i don't know whether this would be an anthology show um mm. that could be interesting does it have michael myers or not does it go right. sort of the halloween three season of the witch root i don't know um but it was interesting that it was tv rights right yeah yeah, yeah. So, so like, yeah. so are the film rights not up for grabs, or those still? I think we, they're just coming out of the David Gordon so Green that. stuff, so I think they're going to wait and let that settle before they even look at that. So yeah. I just didn't know if like movie and TV rights are even are, are split, or if you just like get the rights and then it's up to you to decide what you want to do. Oh, with TV rights, I don't know. I think it's split, so I would imagine. Um, yeah, I'm down for a Halloween show. I mean, it didn't horror. Horror is tough on yeah. Halloween. I don't think horror really works for for me. I don't like, you know, I love Scream. Scream, I didn't watch that series. Uh, right. I haven't watched a lot of like the Kevin Williamson sort of whodunit kind of shows. What um, about AHS, American Horror Story? If you watch them, I don't watch any, any of the American Horror Stories. I don't watch Walking Dead. Like, I, that's just not what TV is for for okay. me. And I'm a huge horror guy. Uh, the I Know What You Did Last Summer show didn't mm. really work. I, wa I was like one of like the seven people who watched that. Hmm. Right. Um, so i just don't know i don't know if the genre really works on television but it all, it's all about the approach yep bloody disgusting uh says that they're currently shopping the rights for film and tv so there you go so it is a package deal in that way so we'll see but i don't know if tv makes sense for halloween i really don't even the uh psycho one right that la went for like two or three years with um oh, i forget what her name is from up in no, the yeah, base motel right yeah, Vera Formiga, Bates well, Motel. I, yeah. I don't why again. I just I can't. Yeah, I can't it's a weird place for to come up with a single horror TV show that I watched and enjoyed. Yeah, only Werewolf by Night, which I thought was really good, but it wasn't a series. Empire fans, do you think what some people say that Ellen Cumming put on her on her show walks so others can? Do you think what some people say that Ellen Cumming put on her show walks so others can run? Sorry, Empire fan, that doesn't make any sense. So if you want to send in as a regular chat, I will read that. Joel Davis says, uh, apart from the Ray and Filoni film, any insight of which films in development the Lucasfilm would prioritize putting to screen? There are so many. Well, we know that the um, uh, the uh, the Ray film is coming first, but we don't know the order of Mangold and Filoni and even if YTT, where it is, or even Ryan Johnson's trilogy, which they keep claiming is still in motion. Uh, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I don't know what the deal is with, with the Ryan Johnson stuff. I uh, With Mangold, I mean, doesn't he still have to do the Bob Dylan movie? Yeah, he's got a so, while to go before he gets to that one. Yeah, yeah. some of the stuff is just far far down the line. I don't know what other pr films or shows they, they plan to prioritize. Mm, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, um, apparently, Shire Folk figured it out in his Shire there. He said, it's not hard to figure out. Oh, sorry, Shire. Did Ellen's coming out allow other shows to run? Uh, oh, coming out as gay, allow other shows to run? No, because what you kids don't understand is in the 1980s, there was a show called Soap, and Billy Crystal played a gay character. 
Go watch 1970s television. There's a lot of gay characters in 1970s television. They're not main characters, but they're certainly gay. Uh, so you've had them as guest stars in shows. So it's not like Ellen was the first gay person on television, for fuck's sake. Come on, guys. Paul Lynn was all over 1970s television. Liberace, for fuck's sake. So come on, guys. Ellen's coming out was hugely influential and inspirational and one of the biggest moments in television history. Uh, and it definitely opened the door um, and paved the way for uh, a lot of shows, I think. Um, yeah, but how many gay characters do you see in shows now, Jeff? A, a billion. I mean... I see more gay characters than straight characters, I feel like. So, okay. well, uh, yeah, I, I, I think Ellen is, you know, a trailblazer uh, who deserves the the credit that she gets for that decision. And, um, yeah, I think the creative community has benefited greatly from it. Fair enough. Uh, I am too fly camp says you guys are right. Boyega is his own talent. Did you watch both? Did you watch the Republican debate last night? We're not getting into that here. Is anyone on the right going to stop Trump from running against? Uh, sorry, I am too well, who are watching the Republican debate. Like yeah, it's an entertainment show, bro. They're evening watching this. Are you my grandfather? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, anyway, uh, let's see what else. Uh, okay, let me. Oh yeah, uh, Tess wants to know, Jeff, have you heard anything about the new Exorcist film? I just got my uh, screening invite for next week. Um, have you heard anything from Exorcist Believer? Not, not from anybody who's directly seen it, no. I've, okay. seen a, I've heard a lot of hearsay from third-party people saying it's not very good, and the shoot, I already, you know, I know the shoot was super chaotic. No. Um, yeah, but, okay. uh, no, I have not heard from anyone who's actually seen it themselves. Okay. Uh, Sam O says, thoughts on Scorsese's recent comments? Well, we're not going to go on for 20 minutes. His, on this yeah, his, his recent comments are the same comments as always. It's the same fucking thing that's been going on for years. Why is this news? I don't know. Because Vanity why, Fair asked him. Why do we ask him? Why, 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 why? Uh, he, I did a show on it la earlier this week. Here's what I'd say, top to bottom. It is simply Scorsese wanting to go back in time to the 1970s. That time doesn't exist anymore. And he is now the William Wyler and the Billy Wilder and the John Ford of that era when he was coming up with his boys in the 1970s. It's now his turn to be the old man in the room. And that's how it goes. He's not going to change cinema by grousing about it and trying to get Christopher Nolan and other people to hit it from all sides. It's not going to work. The, we're, the public has moved on. The world has moved on. Cinema is different now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Marty. There's no going. And Martin back. Scorsese's publicist just cross out all these journalists who ask about Marvel. <laughs> Can they just yeah. cross them off the interview sure. list? Who, why, like, who are these people getting access to Martin Scorsese? I agree. And using agree. that time to ask him about Marvel movies. I agree. I agree. Why Princess, so bad? <laughs> Princess Positive says, since Gareth Edwards is back again, where is Gareth Evans? How can the Raid slash Raid 2 director not be working? He is well, working. He's been he working, working for fucking years on that movie Havoc with Tom Hardy. I don't know. It was supposed to be out last year. It was supposed to be out this fall. Yeah. Now it, I think it's coming out next year. It doesn't feel like it's coming out this year. Although, mm -hmm. you know, with Netflix, they can announce something like, hey, we, we, here's this $200 million movie. It's coming out in four days. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Netflix can do. Um, but yeah, I don't think we'll see Havoc until next year. I would imagine maybe next summer. I think it's going to be fucking awesome. Right. Um, it better be for how long he's fucking taken to, to do it. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the thing, the last thing I'd heard about that movie was that, you know, there'd been all these reshoots and that all the actors had come back with different haircuts. And so oh, Gareth, Gareth uh, had to spend a lot of money to yeah. clean that shit up with VFX. And, and it really, he was just like, I fucking can't do this. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think that's a guy who when this movie does come out, you're not going to see him signing on to another Netflix movie or studio movie. I think he's going to go right back to Indonesia and make <laughs> movies the way he wants to fucking make them. I, 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 can't, I think this process probably drove him fucking nuts. <laughs> yeah, according to IMDb, uh, post-production, Havoc is in post-production, Blister is in development, and he was rumored to do a Deathstroke standalone film in the DC Universe. We'll see how that is. But he has been working. For those of you who don't know, Gangs of London is a series that's been on for the last three years. And Gareth Ed, uh, Dave or Gareth Evans rather has been the creator and director and writer of this series. So if you don't have AMC TV Plus, if you have Max, uh, HBO Max or Max, uh, you can now see the first two seasons of Gangs of London and see Gareth Evans's work because that series is fucking great. I do want to. I, I I do want to watch that. 
Yeah. I just have heard the uh, who's the lead in that? Uh, the guy from uh, the the boxing film that you recommended that I watched with the young guy overseas. Um, Joe, Joe Cole. Joe right? Cole. Yes, yes, he is but, the lead in that. Yes. Who's the black guy though? Is it? It's not. Uh, uh, Soap Derisu is the black Derisu. guy. Right. Okay. 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 Yeah, and he got he had some bond rumors. Yeah, there were rumors about him as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's a good fucking show. Um, all right. Well, there you go, Jeff. I think we should wrap it up. We don't know for an it's hour. Good. Yeah, we've a long time. Yeah, we have gone. All right. All right. Uh, thanks to Jeff for hanging out with us, of course, on the hot mic. Jeff, let people know where the fuck they can find you and everything I going on, brother. Uh, above the line.com, lamag.com, and probably soon, you know, a welfare line. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Come on. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, as for me, you can find me at the Rogue Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch. And, uh, of course, remember to subscribe to the channel. If you want to support the hot mic, subscribe to the channel. Hit a like on this video. Leave comments down below. And for some of you who want to help Jeff and his cause right now, we have this thanks button that is there. If you guys want to donate anything or watching later, you can hit that thanks button and send in some money. We have some great people who send in stuff uh, all the time. Uh, so if you want to do that, uh, you can do that as well. But thanks so much for hanging out with us. We love you madly. Have a great rest of your weekend. Go see a movie. And we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode. I'm the hot mic. Peace.